Okay, we're going to get started. So, welcome to the Center for Cardiovascular Investigations. Welcome to all our speakers. And what I'd like to do is ask Dr. Malcolm Campbell to come up first to say uh, a few words. Thank you very much, Tammy. I'm delighted that, uh, to be here for this event and that I'm not wearing the same suit that I have in the picture behind me, uh, so that at least you know that I have two suits. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a delight to have you all here uh, on behalf of University of Guelph. Uh, a great pleasure uh, to be uh, welcoming. And I meant to check with Tammy in advance. What number is this for uh, research day for? It's number two. But I seem to recall attending three of these. We have all kinds of different reasons. There you go. <laughs> for the Center for uh, Cardiovascular Investigations. And of course, uh, importantly, uh, this year, uh, meeting together with uh, colleagues from across Southern Ontario uh, for uh, Cardiovascular Research Day here at the University of Guelph. Um, I do want to say a couple words about that, but before I do, I do want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran people, and I'd like to acknowledge the Attawandaran as well as our Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe neighbors who call this uh, particular traditional territory their home. It is more recently uh, the uh, treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, and is now, of course, the home for a great many uh, First Nations uh, Métis and Inuit people uh, here uh, within this Attawandaran territory. We're bound to this land, and the Attawandaran tell us that we're bound to this land, through the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which speaks to the idea that we all share collectively from one resource, uh, a finite resource that we share uh, collectively with that one spoon. And I know that many of you have heard me say this before, but I will say it again today. I love the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, not only because of what it speaks to with regards to making sure that we uh, safeguard our valued resources living here on the planet collectively together, but it also speaks to, it, it's a wonderful metaphor for what it is that we do at events like this, that is sharing collectively out of one bowl. In this instance, sharing collectively out of one bowl of knowledge. And I, I really like that this year that the event has been expanded to include other colleagues from across Southern Ontario, uh, and indeed, uh, obviously, uh, colleagues from uh, further west than Southern Ontario, six universities represented here, the 14 faculty members that, uh, that comprise the CCBI here at University of Guelph, creating a really fantastic hub, an intellectual hub of uh, create, creative energy and innovation uh, in the area of cardiovascular research. It is but one bowl, uh, but we do share out of it collectively, and today's event uh, is exactly that, the notion of sharing uh, our knowledge with each other, uh, the knowledge that we've created through the fantastic activities of the people that I've, uh, that I've mentioned. Most importantly, it's a great day and I look around the room and I see uh, the, the many graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and indeed even undergraduate researchers who are participating in this enterprise and really pushing back the frontiers of, of knowledge that we share collectively together. We're going to have five great speakers to learn more uh, from today, a great poster session at the end of the day to be exchanging uh, ideas collectively as a community. What an awesome event. And again, on behalf of University of Guelph, it is just our delight to be welcoming you here to this particular event. Thank you for the opportunity to do so, Tim. Jeff Wichita here, I'm the Dean of Ontario Vintner College and it's certainly a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the Vintner College today. It's great to see how this event between the first and the second has grown and also indeed uh, CCBI uh, has also grown and I want to congratulate Nina and Tammy and the over 100 uh, researchers and students uh, that I know have, have worked hard to make this event possible. And uh, looking at the eager faces here, and I've met a few of the distinguished speakers. Uh, welcome. Uh, I think it's going to be a great day. A lot of people, when they think of the veterinary college in this part of Ontario, uh, they think about uh, the teaching hospital and bringing your pet or your horse or your calf here uh, for advanced care, often referred by uh, your veterinarian on the farm or in your, your little local practice. Uh, not many people think about what goes on behind these walls in terms of biomedical research and certainly many people that we tour through our facility 
uh, are very surprised at the uh, number of researchers and grad students and the programs that we have that are in support of both human and animal health. Uh, and uh, as a college, we have certainly embraced this concept of One Health, uh, that uh, research into animals and research into human health can inform one another and improve life for, for all species. Uh, and I think today we're going to see examples of that. Certainly, uh, from what I understand in biomedical research, uh, the value of companion animal models of disease, such as dogs, cats, horses, uh, uh, is increasingly valued uh, and uh, it's understood uh, that these naturally occurring diseases in animals are very similar to humans uh, and can provide important translational and comparative uh, research opportunities. Uh, we, we certainly do embrace this and we, we, we feel that interdisciplinary research is really part of our DNA here at the University of Guelph. Uh, it certainly uh, has, uh, I guess, differentiated us for, perhaps from some of the other biomedical research uh, programs in this part of Ontario. So we hope to share that with you today and uh, we certainly hope that our distinguished guests uh, and others who are visiting here from off campus, uh, that this opportunity will lead to further interdisciplinary collaborations and I'm sure that you're going to have a wonderful day, so welcome. Okay, so again, a warm welcome to our distinguished scientists who are here for Cardiovascular Research Day 2018. What I'm going to do with the next few minutes is tell you a little bit about who we are, where we came from, what we're doing now, and where we're going to. So we are the Center for Cardiovascular Investigations. These are the PIs uh, that are involved in the University of Guelph, and we represent colleges and, camp and departments all across the campus. So we hail from the Ontario Vet College, the College of Biological Sciences, Biomedical Sciences, Clinical Studies, PopMed, Molecular and Cellular Biology, Human Health and Nutritional Sciences, and Integrative Biology. So the center itself was approved by the University of Guelph Senate in 2015. And what we were essentially doing, there was a core group of us who brought it together, was John Dawson and Glenn Pyle, and I'm probably missing some. But uh, the idea was to really transform our thinking about cardiovascular disease, where we come together from all these different areas across Guelph and start to build something a little bit bigger. So we collectively have expertise ranging from basic research all the way to clinical translation. And so we created this mandate for ourselves, which is to discover new ways to diagnose heart disease, advance therapies, and train the next generation of clinicians and scientists, and this is both in the animal and the human realm. We have a website that you can easily find by Googling cardiovascular research wealth, and it talks a lot more about the things that we're doing, including who all the investigators are, who the students are over the past three to four years, some of the educational programs that we're trying to put together, our facilities, publications by our members, news stories when people win awards and do cool things, and the policies of the center. We also have a Twitter site and a LinkedIn site that the students will talk about in a couple of minutes as well. Collectively, we've been very successful as a cardiovascular group. We've been awarded more than $14 million in competitive research funding over the past five years. And so our funding comes from the sources that you see here. So it's Canadian Foundation for Innovation, CIHR, EDSER, Heart and Stroke Foundation, OMAFRA, Pet Trust, and various industries. In 2015, and this leads a little bit to what Malcolm was talking about, about how we have a variety of talks, but not always research days, we started the Distinguished Scientist Seminar Series, and we brought in various people to come and talk to our members. And so this is really an external to internal thing where we're bringing in specific people who are performing cutting edge research internationally so people can start to see what's going on. Um, we profile our research to various leaders in the world and we're a kind of diverse group so we bring in different people depending on um, who's looking at the profile. And the overall goal is to network people, ideas, and resources. It's like glasses. Okay, and then in 2016, we did our inaugural Cardiovascular Research Day, and so you can see our speakers from uh, last time uh, who came here. In 2016, I also started what are called the CCDI Cardiovascular Scientist Seminars, 
And so the idea was to start to learn a little bit more about what we do here and build our networks here. A lot of times we get invited to go and give talks somewhere else and people know what we do, but we didn't really know what the labs do here. And it really helped to facilitate contacts between the, the PIs and the graduate students as well. So the goals of this are to promote outstanding research of our faculty. We're still working through the faculty now. We do about two or three a year. Uh, and then we'll move on to postdocs and grad students to create these networking events for our grad students. And then we go into the undergrad classrooms and invite the undergrads as well. So the idea is that they'll start to see what the research is that we're doing and hopefully we can attract the best and brightest undergrad students to our cardiovascular and health sciences labs. Okay, and these are just some pictures of uh, some of the current events that we did. We also do member events, and these are initiated in large part because some, one of our members takes on the initiative to do it. So for example, this is Dr. John Dawson's Shot for the Heart speaker night. And this is where you pair a researcher with a heart stroke survivor, and they both talk about you know, what's going on in heart disease research from the different perspectives of being a researcher or a survivor. John's also been really instrumental in putting this together and in several years with uh, Love, who's a graduate student here, where we do the Ride for Heart every year. And these are just pictures from different years. And lots more people come. These are just the ones that were on my laptop. It's a lot of fun for anyone who wants to participate. They close the gardener and the DVP. We raise money for heart research, and it's, it's a big event. And more recently, Jeremy, Dr. Jeremy Simpson brought this one forward where members of the CCBI had the opportunity to meet with federal MP Lloyd Longfield. This is when the CIHR funding paradigms were kind of flipping around, and we had the opportunity to inform our MP uh, and hear from him as well about science funding in Canada. So that's kind of where we came from and where we are now. These are some of the potential strategic directions in terms of where we're going next. So one thing that we've been floating around with is the idea of creating a more formal academic program for graduate students in cardiovascular and health sciences. And key to this would be to provide expanded experiential learning components so that people can get into other labs and learn other techniques. Maybe some of my mouse people can learn fish techniques, and fish people can come to the clinics and start to learn veterinary medicine, or some sort of combination of that. Um, we also want to build our basic translational and clinical cardiology components. And so we did tours this morning, and different people went to different, different places of our, of our visitors. Um, but they got to see some of the areas where we're building strength, so that would include the Hagen Ath Labs, the Comparative Clinical Research Facilities, the Human Exercise Physiology Labs, and of course the unique things that each of the PIs do. Another thing that we're trying to do, and you probably have heard on some of the, seen on some of the emails, you see it on your name tags, and on some of the documents, is this thing called SOPRA. And so this is the first year for SOPRA, and what we're trying to do is a sort of grassroots building cardiovascular research, and here we're talking research specifically, us, um, across Ontario. The name is a little bit in flux. Um, it might be the Southern Ontario Cardiovascular Research Association, which is what I first called it, modeling it on things like SONA, Southern Ontario Neuroscience Association, or SORBA, Southern Ontario Reproductive Biology Association. But it was pointed out to me, and you'll hear a little bit more about it in a minute, but it was pointed out that Ontario is not that big beyond Southern Ontario, and it might be better just to include Ontario in general, in which case the name might be Scientists in Ontario Cardiovascular Research Association, or something else. So that's kind of what it is. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, a few years ago, we started our gra executive graduate student councils. It would be impossible to bring people together from all across the campus if we didn't have the buy-in from the labs, and especially the organizational skills uh, and help from all the different uh, students in the labs. And so these are the 2018 postdoctoral and graduate student executives representing each of the labs. The idea here is that they help bring it together, but they also learn how we put these events together, and it creates leadership skills and things that go on their CV for their own future um, futures that they build. And last year we started with the 2018 undergrad student executives as well, so sort of providing leadership opportunities for the next generation and really being able to tap into the undergrad population and see what some of their needs are as well. 
So before I go any further, I want to just say to all the student executives who were involved, thank you so much for all the, all the things that you did uh, behind the scenes and will continue to do over the course of today, as well as various other people like Brian, who's up there uh, working and helping us uh, with the video. We want to thank all our sponsors, and you can see them all here. So funding for today was, cut, was paid for by the Ontario Veterinary College, College of Biological Sciences, Office of Research, Office of Grad Studies, Department of Biomedical Sciences, Lyme Diller and Cellular Biology, HHNS, Integrated Biology, OVC Pet Trust, and you can see that we have people here from all kinds of universities from across uh, Ontario. And I just want to say one extra word about OVC Pet Trust, so they're the ones that gave us the bags and uh, the pens, and there's a magazine in there as well. So for those of you who don't know, OVC Pet Trust was founded in 1986 at the Ontario Vet College, and it's Canada's first charitable fund dedicated to the health and well-being of companion animals. And so they support a lot of the research that goes specifically towards animal health, and funds also build some of our equipment and facilities at the Vet College. Uh, you can learn more by Googling them, but they also put in the Fall Best Friends magazine. Uh, and we included it in part because it's got um, research by some of our member groups in there too. So Dr. Sonia from Faro's work on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats is profiled. There's a bit of Dr. Kyle's dilated cardiomyopathy dog stuff in there. And our circadian medicine, which we apply to heart disease, but also we've done work trying to build uh, towards building a better ICU for health and welfare of animals. Okay, so with that being said, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about SOCRA, and I'm going to invite Dr. Rob Tashima up, who is the Chair of Biology at York University, and Jeremy Simpson, representing HHNS and CES, and they're going to describe sort of where we've been thinking about going with this. Good? Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'll do it. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, I'd like to thank Tammy for giving me the opportunity to participate in this event. Uh, this is the first time I've come to Sokra. I also thank Christine and Priya because they did a lot of help organizing uh, today's event as well. So as you can see, the name is in flux. We had talked about whether it's going to be Southern Ontario or Scientists in Ontario. I think Scientists in Ontario so that it expands and uh, encourages other colleagues from Northern Ontario, Laurentian, and Lakehead to attend as well maybe in the future. So the purpose of this conference, and you know, I think Tammy has been quite instrumental in organizing, as well as her colleagues here at the University of Guelph, is to really assemble Ontario researchers, as well as trainees, with an interest in heart research, or cardiovascular, so heart and vascular, as well as maybe stroke, renal, respiratory, so more of an integrative type of conference. Because right now, we don't have something quite regional, there's Canadian Cardiovascular Congress, there's American Heart or other uh, national, international meetings, but nothing regional. And that's something I think really is important for us in the community. Also, it's a great opportunity for us to network, to meet each other. Some of us, you know, I don't see colleagues unless they go to Ottawa or other con conferences. So this is a really a nice opportunity for not only the researchers, but the students, to mingle, interact, and network. Also to talk about other things other than research, career paths, as well as training opportunities and career opportunities. So I'd like to thank Christine and Priya for this map. This just kind of conveys all the institutions within Ontario where there are people doing cardiovascular and respiratory research. So pretty much every institute, as well as not only universities, but research institutes as well, affiliated with some of the universities. So we are a large group, then this provides great opportunity for us to come together, assemble, and talk in a very informal you know, manner, hopefully on an annual basis. So the, we thought the foci would be going from molecular you know, to One Health. So really expand the whole, sorry, pillars, if you want, of CIHR, from molecular to cell, to animal and human health, as well as well-being, and One Health, community and population health. Under all these different, you know, areas 
that we're all interested in studying. So this is, a, again, a nice broad meeting, very informal meeting for us to come together and just talk about science. Also maybe the state of science and funding within our country. So when you bring in groups like this together to talk about science, there's other opportunities which we can also discuss and you know, look into, such as strategic team grants, training grants, equipment grants, because with funding being it is what it is today and very difficult, sometimes if you go in as a team and a really established team, that funding agencies like that. They see, you know, better bang for the buck. So such as CHR strategic grants, the answer are CREATE, which is a training program, as well as a research tool and instrument grant, and the National Center of Excellence, which also provides research funding as training. So there's a lot of funding opportunities there, sometimes being a group or team rather than individual makes uh, the success rate increase. Also, not just for funding, but in all the stakeholders, such as colleagues who serve on panels, granting agency, or in, maybe even industri sorry, industrial partners, as I said at the bottom, that you may want to have opened this as a dialogue for advocacy groups, for such as patient advocacy groups or industry partners. So again, there's a lot of opportunity and we can see the fruits of our research when it, you see where it can lead to benefits within the community. So some of the future plans, because this is the second year of SOCRA, uh, this is some of the things that Jeremy Simpson, Tammy and I talked about. One thing I thought was really nice that Tammy had was this white paper that may be published in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, where what is the state of research, cardiovascular research and stroke research within Ontario? There's a lot of researchers, but what are we doing? I mean, that's something maybe not doing enough of translating or advocate, advocating the work we do. I mean, we, I feel that recently there was a large, strong advocacy program to kind of pressure the federal government to put more money into tri-council funding, CHR and CERC, sure. And I think it was very successful because the government put in over a billion dollars in the last federal budget. The other things we more for this conference is the discussion of having it as an annual meeting. When should we have it? You know, is the fall, this type of in time of year, best summer we had potentially in June. We also thought there is the idea of maybe having two institutions share the responsibility. So one will host it and the other one will learn for the next year so that each institution, and we like to share the responsibility around Southern Ontario, not just have it at 12, so other institutions across Southern Ontario or even in Northern Ontario can host this event, but that organizing committee just doesn't take charge without maybe learning what the previous years Organizes, uh, organizing committee did. So allows for continuity and assistance. We thought, it, you know, a good venue for this type of conference is to be student-centric, to enhance, you know, trainee opportunities to present their work. We all have some keynote speakers today from faculty, but I think what's really important is to the trainees, because you will be the next generation re research leaders in this area. So I think it's giving you the opportunity now will just help your career going forward. So that was another idea we, we thought we'd like to have. Um, I think that is the last slide. Yep, so that's sort of where it stands. Oh, maybe I should say that next year, I took Tammy, I would um, be happy to host it at York University. So opportunity now come to Toronto, we have a subway, so it's easy to come. I hope people don't have a strike. And then uh, <laughs> things like that. And you know, get to see other institutions. A lot of you maybe been to Toronto, how many of you have been to New York? You know, so things like that. So I think showcasing the research groups at the insert different institutions would be very helpful. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, and if anyone has any comments or input and stuff, like feel free to email any of us. Okay. Uh, the student representatives for cardiovascular research day today are going to make four key announcements and then we're going to start with the speakers. Okay, so we just have a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. So I'm Christine and I'm here with Priya and Aiden and you're going to see us a few times throughout the afternoon. So first off, on behalf of the entire Student Executive Council, we want to welcome you all on our CCBI Cardiovascular Research Day. And a special thanks to all of these members of our Student Executive Council, because without all their help in promoting and organizing this event, it really wouldn't be possible without them. So thank you to you guys. And also, you all received a conference bag when you came in today. So I just want to let you know, in that bag, you're going to find today's itinerary. You're also going to find a short bio on each of our five distinguished speakers. You're going to find page of our posters, the presenters and their presentation titles, and that's going to occur at the end of the afternoon today. And also a page on our CCBI executive faculty and also our executive undergraduate and graduate student council. So again, without those two executive faculty members and student council members, this really wouldn't be possible. So again, a big thank you to them. All right. Uh, so importantly, uh, we would like to remind our speakers um, that they will have 30 minutes for their talks and then we'll have a five minute question period uh, after their talk. And so again, 30 minutes for the talk and then five minutes for questions. Um, so all three of us will come up to the front towards the end of your talk to remind you that you have a couple minutes left. Uh, we've got a strict schedule. And um, uh, for the audience, again, we have five minutes for questions at the end of the talks. But of course, we have more opportunity for questions and networking at our poster session uh, immediately after our speaker session. And uh, we would also like to encourage you to please take photos and to tweet these photos and use our hashtags, uh, hashtag Guelph and hashtag CCVI. Um, and also, you're more than welcome to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to keep up with our cardiovascular events as well. All right, we now have the honor of calling our first session chair, Dr. Jeremy Simpson, to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Peter Bax. Well, good afternoon. Thanks very much for the invitation and for the honor of coming up and introducing uh, Dr. Peter Bax. Dr. Peter Bax is a Tier 1 CRC chair at York University, and he's also a professor in the Department of Biology. He's a senior scientist at University Health Network in the Division of Cellular and Molecular Medicine and also in the Division of Cardiology at University of Toronto. Um, for some of you guys in the audience, you were almost in the same position I was several years ago when I was an undergraduate student. I was at Queen's University and attending a talk just like this and I had the honor of meeting Dr. Bax the first time and when he came in, some of the research he presented was really awe-inspiring. I really liked some of the ways of how he went from the cell all the way up to the whole animal to describe his pathology. It was actually at that time I decide that that would be the type of person I'd want to do a postdoc with. And uh, I actually did pursue and, and worked for uh, several years with Dr. Peter Bax. Um, he is a well-established researcher. He's published over 190 publications, some of the top tier journals, so specifically in Nature, Cell, Journal of uh, Clinical Investigation, Circulation, and Circ Research. He has supervised many outstanding graduate students that hold a number of top faculty positions across Canada as well as institutes. And in fact, our inaugural uh, speaker series was done by Dr. Gavin Otto, who also trained with Dr. Peter Bax. Um, some of you guys may recognize him. He actually started his roots of uh, research here at University of Guelph. He did his undergraduate degree in biophysics, followed by his uh, degree in veterinary medicine. So if you actually go towards the OBC hallways, going through the hallways, you'll see the pictures from his ears and his pictures up there on the walls. Um, after that, he did his MSc here at the Department of Guelph, his PhD at the University of Calgary before he did a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins University with Dr. Eduardo Marban. So as a, uh, a token of our appreciation, I'd like to present to Dr. Peter Bax in honor as a distinguished speaker here at the uh, cardiovascular research place. Sure. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. And today, Dr. Peter Bax will talk about adverse atrial remodeling induced by intense exercise, understanding atrial fibrillation in heart disease. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeremy. I thought for sure he was going to roast me. <laughs> uh, 
That's usually what people do. And you know, Rob Tashima was also my postdoc. And uh, I'm going to start with this story. No, first I'm going to say, uh, Tammy uh, and the group here at Guelph, congratulations. I think what you guys are doing is uh, really something that's dearly needed. Uh, and we actually belong to the Upstate New York EP Society, and we do something actually very comparable to what you're suggesting, and moving things around and getting involvement. And it's also very student-centric. Am I supposed to? You can hear me, right? This is for the camera at the back, oh, the camera, so it's not going to okay. amplify yeah. your voice, but it will scratch the So I'll never be able to live any of this down anymore, right? So, <laughs> so where do I hook it up there? So. Um, is there so a can I hang it like that? <laughs> oh, the clips are. Okay, so. You should never give me an IQ test in front of everybody. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, what was I saying about Rob? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Rob was my postdoctoral fellow. And uh, when I, uh, you know, Rob and I have talked about this uh, subsequently several times, how uh, back in those days when people used to leave my lab and they were usually leave running, uh, I, would, I would get them to agree that if I ever needed a job, they would actually give me one. Uh, and so it turned out that Rob was nice enough to actually live up to his word because I moved from U of T to York about two years ago and he's actually the guy who hired me. Uh, so thanks, Rob. <laughs> This has been a great move. Okay. So um, what else did I want to say? Uh, thank you to all the hospitality that I've received over the last couple of days. And I'm honored to be here and to also be speaking with a number of other very distinguished speakers. Uh, distinguished always makes me kind of feel a little awkward like an imposter. Well, you'll find out I am one. So I'll just uh, state it up front. Okay. So I'm going to talk. Uh, you can see the title. I'm going to talk about atrial fibrillation, even though I'm going to go at it from the standpoint of exercise. Uh, and that's a little bit counterintuitive, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that. That's going to be sort of one of the central themes uh, I'm going to actually try to follow as I go through at my talk. Um, I actually suffer from atrial fibrillation myself, and so that's really why we study it, right? Because my favorite topic is me, and so uh, people in my lab might not agree with me, but actually, nevertheless, that's more or less what we study. And the people that actually have done most of the work that I'm going to talk about are actually up here. He's a postdoc now. He's got a job in uh, Manhattan. He get, makes twice the money I do. Uh, I'm hoping he might actually give me a job someday as well. <laughs> as far as that, as a dude star, the biggest challenge with him was actually learning to uh, pronounce his name. I'm going to definitely go over time on my talk, but we'll see how we, can, how we, uh, we survive this. Uh, OK, and so he's actually a, now a, a third year, I think, medical student at Queens. Uh, Yana Oh just moved back to, um, to Korea. Uh, she's a master's student. And Rob Lacken is sort of, my, he's my new postdoc. Uh, also, I, I was co-supervising kind of him and his PhD. So these are the people who actually have done almost all of the work that I'm actually going to talk about. I had very little to do with it, actually. Okay, so, so I'm going to talk to you about exercise. But the whole idea is that there's a connection between exercise and atrial fibrillation. And I don't think I really need to put this in, but I, you know, just for completeness, I guess, we know that the heart actually works by, you know, electrical synchronization. It starts in the SA node, it goes down to the atria. There's a conducting system that then takes things down into the ventricle. And we know that that creates a nice orderly sequence, right, of contraction, mechanical, electromechanical coupling. When you get atrial fibrillation, what happens is things become highly irregular. So you got a nice regular heartbeat here, and those electrical signals are really telling us when the heart actually contracts or precedes the contraction. What happens with atrial fibrillation is that there's sort of random electrical behavior that happens in the atria. That starts to create random electrical signals going down into the ventricle, and you get this, this uh, plethora of different things happening. Primarily what it leads to is a very irregular, rapid beating of the ventricle. The ventricle becomes very inefficient as a pump. And if you have those events, as I have had uh, over many years, you run into things like fainting, fatigue. And if you're a sports guy or a sports person, you suddenly can't do your sport, right? And that was really the thing that was most depressing for me. Uh, and some of the more important things, though, uh, more critical things are that if you get it, 
and you have heart disease, and as I'll tell you, heart disease is kind of a precursor to atrial fibrillation. It actually accelerates the disease. So once you get AF, it's actually putting you on this, this one-way street, and it's not a good one. Uh, and then the final thing that's well known is it's an increased incidence of stroke. About one in every five stroke victims in Ontario, it's actually linked to atrial fibrillation. So it's a huge problem. Now, atrial fibrillation is not itself a disease. It's actually a consequence of lots of different diseases. And we know that there's a number of things that predispose to it. And personal genetics, for sure, we know, right? There's families. If you've got a, a member in your family that has AF, you know, you probably want to be, you know, monitoring your other family members because there's a very strong link between genetics, just like many diseases. Uh, and the personal side, age is, the, is one of, the, as I'll show you, one of the biggest predictors, right? The older you get is the more likely you are to get AF. And by the time you're 75 years old, about 15% of males and about 10% of females will have atrial fibrillation or be suffering from, you know, trying to control the condition. We know there's lots of environmental factors, diet, lack of exercise, but I'm going to show you that exercise actually can drive processes that look or, or create conditions of atrial fibrillation. And here's the big one really is comorbidities, right? Poor cardiovascular health. If you've got cardiovascular disease or diabetes is another factor, you will be much more prone to developing the condition of atrial fibrillation. And this is just like to give you a sense of sort of what we know about the condition. So on the left here is just showing you all the different conditions, hypertension, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, arthritis, all cardiovascular disease conditions strongly linked to increased incidence of AF. So it's, it's a consequence of having those particular conditions. So the general statement is poor cardiovascular health, very likely to develop atrial fibrillation. The right here just shows you the age dependence, okay? And you can see how strongly it depends on age. And I started to get my a AF right around in this area, right? So I was on the, really the low end in terms of risk, but I actually, once you get it, you got it, right? You're, you're not a statistic. But by the time, you know, you age, it, it really is driven up. And this is a huge health burden, right? Because of the stroke and because of all the other things I told you about that actually are associated with uh, AF. So it's a big problem. And we know that it's rising as a problem because cardiovascular health is getting worse and people are aging, right? The population is shifting to a, a higher and higher life expectancy. So the net result is this condition is becoming more and more common. Uh, and the third uh, issue that I want to raise with you is again this concept that if you have poor health overall, if you don't exercise, if you have a bad lifestyle, bad diet, uh, you also are extremely prone to atrial fibrillation. This has relatively only recently been identified. Uh, and this just illustrates if you're obese, this, the, you know, and once you reach the obesity uh, or obese on the, on, on the uh, uh, BMI scale, right, about within 10 years or so, your incidence starts to go up a lot in terms of atrial fibrillation. And one of the things that happens with people that are obese is they get massive atria, actually, and no one really knows exactly why that is, right? So again, consistent with the idea that bad cardiovascular health overall is, is, is really driving uh, the, the likelihood of you actually developing atrial fibrillation, especially if you actually have underlying genetic predispositions. And if you have, um, so this is taken from some recent data in a, in a Lancet paper that actually looked at different risk factors and asked the question, you know, how, how likely are you to get it and how do these different risk factors actually accumulate or, or interact? And it's very clear. If you have one risk factor, you know, you're going to have a certain uh, incidence of AF, but they actually accumulate. The more of them you have is the more likely you are to develop atrial fibrillation. So if you're obese and you have cardiovascular disease and you're old, right, you're almost certainly going to get AF uh, a, with a very, very high likelihood. Okay, so... Um, and on the flip side, this is data actually taken from, uh, I can't remember if they're overweight or obese. And the question they asked was, if an individual is overweight and has poor cardiovascular health, even without correcting the obesity or the over overweight condition, how does exercise actually impact on AF? So I've already told you they get AF. And this actually shows 
that in that population, if you just have them exercise, not even correct their, their, their BMI, you get a dramatic drop in the incidence of atrial fibrillation. So on the flip side, if you do things like, you know, you have good diet or you have uh, engage in exercise, you can really impact on the incidence of, of atrial fibrillation. You can really reduce the incidence very, very dramatically. And here you can see that the more you do, right, this is METs, this is metabolic equivalent of tasks. So it's actually telling you about how hard you're working, how about how hard you're exercising. And you can see the harder you exercise is the better it is for you. And it's also known from heart disease patients, right? If you actually exercise heart disease patients, you can reduce, you can first of all, reduce the risk of them actually having uh, hospitalization events, but you also dramatically reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation in that population. So we've got this concept, right? That there's a balance that exists between sort of like bad activities and good activities. And they're the ones that we know about, right? Caloric intakes, uh, fit into this paradigm, right? That you get poor cardio, cardiovascular health if you don't eat well, you don't do any exercise. On the flip side, if you eat well, right, you, do, you engage in physical exercise, you're going to have good cardiovascular health, good health overall, and AF fits right into that, right? It fits in perfectly into this concept that lifestyle is an important factor in actually the, the condition itself. But you know, there's some recent data and I consider myself to be sort of part of this study, these types of studies, uh, because I developed AF at, at a very young age. And there's been this idea for quite a while that too much, you know, exercise is a good thing, but there is such a thing as too much exercise. And I know there's a number of, of um, uh, physical education and individuals doing exercise physiology here at Guelph, and I don't need to, uh, I'm sure I don't need to convince them that, that, that you can have you know, excessive exercise, there's, there's such a thing as over-exercising. And if you've got pre-existing uh, genetic conditions, you can actually truly exacerbate certain, certain conditions in individuals. The best one, the best described is ARVD, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, where patients are told not to exercise, right? It's probably the, one of the few conditions where that actually occurs. Um, and of course, we know the, the, the examples of sudden cardiac death, right, where the soccer player's out, young man, young woman, out on the field, and suddenly they just drop, right? Those are almost invariably arrhythmias, not always, uh, but those, those are all examples of where exercise does have a certain level of risk, okay? So there is this idea that's been out there, and it's, it's heavily disputed as to how important this actually is, and I'm going to make the case that it's actually quite important, and I'm going to tell you why I think that is, and I'm also going to tell you that I think it's important to understand it because I think what goes on in athletes uh, that develop atrial fibrillation is telling us about what's going on in heart disease patients. And this is the actual hard data when we talk about atrial fibrillation um, and the impact of exercise. Okay, so this is a meta-analysis that was done. And what you see here is, so this is essentially the risk of atrial fibrillation, okay? And if you look at diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, I told you about this, right? There's actually an increased inc incidence of atrial fibrillation. Now, this, this connection with BMI, right, is small, but there's other studies. So this is just, you know, a subset of studies. And you'll notice here, it's also what I already told you, if you have mild levels of exercise, you reduce your risk of atrial fibrillation. But here's the endurance sport athletes. And these are, this is taken from... Um, studies where they're really high-end athletes, right? They're rowers, they're cyclists, and they have an incidence, a risk of, of AF, which rivals that of heart disease, right? So you can see their risk is increased by about five times as a result of engaging in endurance sport. And if that wasn't enough, there's a, a beautiful study done, I think it was in Norway, Norway or Sweden, uh, of 52,000 skiers. Right, so they've got this huge database. And what they found was that AF incidents in that population correlated with how good you were, how many, how many times you skied, this is cross-country skiers, how many times you won events, how well you placed in your events, all correlated with atrial fibrillation. So the idea is you push yourself hard enough, right, and you r run the risk of actually developing, uh, you know, and promoting atrial fibrillation. Now, how am I on time? Am I done? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you some data at some point here, right? Um, should have brought my clock. OK, I just want to know how fast I should be talking, actually, here. You're about halfway. Halfway? OK, I'm doing OK. Better than usual, all right? So I'm proud of myself. OK, now, some of you are going to go home and say, leave this lecture, and you're going to say, you know, Bax says don't do any exercise, right? <laughs> That's not what Bax says, OK? In fact, I say the total opposite. Um, but this is actually data from cyclists from a, a Paris group. And it shows you something very interesting. It actually shows that uh, your, long, your life expectancy just go, gets longer the more you do. Okay? And these are cyclists, and these are high-end cyclists. And the, the curve to the furthest to the right here are the cyclists in Paris that did the most cycling. Okay? So if you want to live longer, go at it. Right? Go as hard as you can, as hard as uh, uh, you, your body permits, right? because that's the outcome. And I would argue not only do you live longer, but your quality of your life is way better as well. Like, I'd be interesting to see you know, what the cost right, in terms of health care are for those groups versus others. And so that's one example. And then there's, there's uh, another summary study that was done, uh, an analysis that just looked at you know, risk of death just in general, right? Uh, and again, this is the, the numbers here just correspond to what the exercise capacity was of the individuals. And you can see a very strong correlation, right? You just live longer, the fitter you are, okay? So get off your butts and do more. Okay, so yet, right, they get AF. Okay, and I told you the reason I'm interested in this is primarily because I'm interested in myself. But also, I believe that what we learn from our models is going to tell us about atrial fibrillation in general. And I'll try to make that case as we move forward. So a number of years ago, Ruse and Farzad set up uh, in, our, in my lab the ability to actually generate exercise models uh, in mice. And we actually created, they created three different types. Swim, which is, I'm going to show you mainly data from the swim mice. Uh, treadmill running, where they're actually running at about a 30 degree incline. And freewheel running, okay? And everything I'm going to show you, most of what I'm going to show you is actually the swim versus uh, the sedentaries. And usually we have about three or four of these mice actually in a bucket. And the way this is actually set up is there's a pump that's producing current. And these are CD1 mice, and they love their daily swims, right? They absolutely love it. We wake them up every day, so they, they better get used to it. But they actually really don't mind the exercise at all. And they're, they're almost addicted to it, just like people do get addicted. So here's what happens if you look at mice that you swim for six weeks, OK? And it's exactly what we know happens, right? Athletes have lower heart rates, right? They have enlarged hearts. Uh, they have better heart function. That's what this data is all showing. So, you know, this is just the, how we measure the ECGs. This is just a circadian rhythm, right? This is a circadian pattern of heart rate variation during the day-night cycles. And you can see that heart rates go down at night. And the black bars are actually the exercise. You can see their heart rate is down, whether it's day or night, whether they're sleeping or, or active, right? Their heart rates are always down. The b hearts get a little bit larger, and we all know that, right? Athletes have a little bit bigger heart, so they're a little bit dilated. If you look at their heart function, we did this with hemodynamics, you can show their hearts are stronger. They're actually able to contract more vigorously, and that's also consistent with you know, what uh, exercise actually does to the heart. It's exactly what you see in humans, right? So that was good, right? We, we got a mouse, we're just throwing him in a pail, right? And he starts to look like a, an athlete. So the next question that we actually asked was, we went right to the, right to the, uh, the, big, the big question as, do they, after just six weeks, show any signs that would be indica indicative of bad changes in the atria? Because everything I showed you up until now has been heart rate and ventricular function, right? But we're really interested in what's going on in the atria. And this shows you what happens. And I'll just, this is just doing how we did the experiments. And it's, it's pretty much the way you do it in a human. You pass a catheter, in this case, down into the right ventricle and the right atria. And then you do what's called program stimulation. So you can try to induce arrhythmias. And what you find in the exercise mice is that you can induce, this is treadmill now as well as swimming, you can indeed, in about 40% of these mice after six weeks, you can induce bouts of atrial fibrillation. Okay? They don't happen spontaneously. We have to induce them, but they're inducible. And in a normal sedentary mouse, it's very rare 
and very difficult to actually induce these events. The ventricle, on the other hand, if you try to induce uh, arrhythmias in the ventricle, they're actually reduced in incidence, right? You can do the odd one will go into ventricular fibrillation with these protocols, but none of them would after, after exercise. So there's something different going on, right? The ventricle's good, but the atria are not so happy as a result of these, uh, of these uh, exercises. And by the way, I should have told you that the bouts of exercise are 90 minutes twice a day, okay? And they're spread by about four or five hours, okay? And they get the weekends off, right? Because the grad students, it's, they don't come in on the weekends, no. No, we do give them two days off. Okay, now, there's a lot of other things that we characterize, but I'm gonna come back to what the meat of the matter is. And I already told you the hearts get bigger, and that's illustrated here again. But interestingly enough, if you ask the question, do the atria get bigger relative to the ventricles? And the answer is yes. If you, if you take the ratio of the increase in size of the atria, it's actually excessive relative to the ventricle. Ventricles get bigger as well, but atria get even larger. Okay? So that's one of the interesting things that happens. If you look at conduction velocity, right, that's all about the electricity controlling the contraction. There's slowing of the, of the conduction. Uh, and there's also, in, in conjunction with that, there's something called P-wave duration uh, increases. And those are related to each other because the conduction velocity in the atria is related to how long the electricity takes to, to travel. All of these changes are predicted to have an impact on atrial fibrillation susceptibility. So some of them are no doubt going to be factors in what I showed you before in terms of them developing atrial fibrillation. There's a whole bunch of other stuff we looked at in these mice. Like for example, they have changes in autonomic tone, which we also know actually happens in athletes. And that, and again, can actually influence your atrial fibrillation. But here's the important thing that actually, we believe the important thing that actually happens. And the reason we think it's so important is because this is exactly what happens in a human with atrial fibrillation. You take any human with, uh, with AF, this is what you'll see, okay? And what is it? It's actually fibrosis. So this is a sedentary animal, and this is a, a, a cross-section, a histological section of atria, atrial muscle. And you can see that there's this redness. And red is picoserious red, and it's a way of quantifying and seeing collagen, okay, which is fi fibrous tissue. And generally speaking, I think most of us, uh, you know, it's not hard for me to, uh, to convince you that having a bunch of connective tissue in your muscle is probably not a good thing, right? And it's certainly possible or certainly likely that it's involved in, in setting up bad electrical patterns within the tissue as well. In addition to this, you also see the infiltration of macrophages, okay? A second well-known feature of atrial fibrillation in humans. Fibrosis and inflammation are the two hallmarks of atrial fibrillation. We get them in the exercised animals. So then we were on the hunt of, okay, so why is that? Why are the atria differentially affected, right, from the, from the ventricles? So the first thing we did was microarrays, and we've extended these to do uh, RNA-seq. To make a long story short, what it did was it pointed us to an inflammatory pathway called TNF-alpha, is a, is a factor that's known to be very important in innate immunity. It's involved in it's all kinds of, integrated into all kinds of signaling pathways. So it doesn't necessarily tell us a whole lot, but it certainly was consistent with the idea, right, that it might be involved because we had inflammation. This is an inflammatory factor. So we just went out on the limb and we said, well, let's hypothesize that TNF-alpha is important or involved in some way, we didn't know how, in these, in these changes that are actually happening in the atria. So what TNF-alpha is, it's produced in virtually every cell of the body. It's primarily produced by immune cells, actually macrophages, the ones that are actually infiltrating, infiltrating our, our atria. And it actually signals through a couple of different receptors. There's a receptor one and a receptor two. It signals by being solubilized and it also signals by being attached in the membrane. So it's extremely complicated. But we just did the, 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 the um, most obvious thing. We said, well, what if we just block it? What if we just eliminate it? And we did that in two ways. We treated our mice with a Tanner set. Some of you might know what that is. It's a biologic that are, is injected into a lot of people that have intrinsic inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis is a prime example, where it's injected into the joints, for example. Okay, and it is basically sequesters soluble TNF-alpha and also blocks membrane bound. 
And then we also had, we, uh, our next door neighbor at U of T was when we started this, was Stefan Bowles, and he happened to be working on TNF alpha knockout mice at the time. So we just took some of his mice and we did these studies. And lo and behold, it was a home run. And if you do, if you treat these mice with, where am I here? With the tanner set or in the knockouts, you cannot induce atrial fibrillation in them, right? They're, they're like, it's, it's incredible. And on top of that, if you look at the inflammatory cells, they're not there and there's no fibrosis. So however TNF alpha works, once it's not there, right, you don't get any of those changes that are driven by, uh, by, the, uh, by the exercise. And if you now, now this is lots of notes, lots of stuff up here, right? But basically the whole point of this table is to say, if you look at all the physiological changes that I told you about, right, with exercise, they're all still there. The hearts get a little bit bigger, they're stronger, their heart rate goes down. All those other things are still intact. So the only thing that seemed to be affected was stuff going on in our atria, okay? So we're now on the hunt to try to figure out, you know, exactly what it is about TNF alpha signaling that's actually important. So depending on how much time, the strategy is I'm gonna try to summarize how we think about the problem. And then if there's a little bit of time left, I'll just tell you how we're going about trying to dissect further how TNF alpha is actually working and asking some other questions like, is this reversible? How much exercise do you need, right? Is this applicable to humans, right? Those are the kinds of questions that we're asking. So what I've tried to convince you of, well, and, and it's no doubt that atrial fibrillation uh, is associated with inflammation and, and fibrosis in humans, that's, that's just a fact. Uh, we also know that intense endurance exercise, right, leads to lone AF, and it also creates, by the way, I didn't mention this, but it, cr it creates kind of a, a semi-inflammatory condition, right? Marathon runners often have elevated uh, uh, um, oxidative stress and inflammatory factors. What I showed you is that um, if you take mice and you swim them for six weeks, twice a day for 90 minutes, they get changes that are just like what you see in, in humans. And that TNF alpha, and I didn't uh, focus on the uh, P38 pathway, but we know P38 is also, which is in integrated into TNF alpha signal, it is also a potential target for actually preventing these changes. So what we think goes on is, is illustrated here. And we did a series of studies where we uh, did telemetry implants into mice. And uh, this idea actually came from Stefan Bowles, okay? And how much time do I have because I, I I'm gonna just end on this slide, so I'll just tell you the story. So Stefan Bowles is actually a vascular biologist. And in parallel with these experiments, they were actually playing around with TNF alpha. And what they were able to show is that their myogenic response, that's the ability of a, of a, of a resistance vessel to constrict as a result of an increase in blood pressure. It's kind of a way to protect the capillaries from excessive blood pressure that that was completely TNF alpha dependent. So in other words, if they put a TNF alpha blocker, they completely prevented the myogenic response. Well, a myogenic response is really a mechanosensitive process, right? It's the pressure trying to open up the vessel and it actually constricts. So this is completely consistent with what we know AF. All the people that get AF, all the conditions that lead to AF, all lead to elevations in venous pressure. And venous pressure means the atria stretch. They have to, right, because they're under pressure. And so that's kind of where we got the idea. And so this is actually just an example of that kind of reasoning in skeletal muscle, right? This is from a skeletal muscle uh, review article, and they point out that TNF alpha is itself actually a mechanical sensor, okay? So it's not just in the smooth muscle. And here's what happens when you actually exercise a mouse. And the same thing happens in humans. And in a horse, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about a horse in a minute. Uh, this is the beginning of the exercise. So the mouse is actually thrown into the water. You can see the heart rate goes up. You can see the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure goes up dramatically. And that happens every time you exercise, your systolic pressure goes up, right? You have to, and in fact, it's necessary for you to get good uh, performance uh, during an exercise bout. But here's what happens on the back side of the heart, the venous side the venous side pressure also goes up, okay? And that's what the atria see. So if you, if you double your, your venous pressure, you're doubling your pressure in your, in your atria, that's gonna cause them to stretch. And we think that's the mechanical sensing that actually might be taking place. 
And down here, I won't get into this, but this is our measurements of how stretchable the atria are. To make a long story short, the atria are very pliable, and partly because they're so small, they're thin-walled, right? Whereas the ventricles are very resistant to stretch. And we think that explains why atria and ventricles actually have a discordant response, right, to exercise. And again, uh, I'm going to tell you that we believe that aging, cardiovascular disease, and other conditions, okay, I'm being told now I have to stop, uh, and other conditions all lead to exactly the same thing. Venous pressure goes up, and if you talk to a clinician that is, you know, dealing with heart failure patients, they'll tell you the venous side, right, we call it congestive heart failure in the case of very advanced cardiovascular disease. Why? Because the venous pressure is so high that you're actually pushing fluid out into the tissues. That's why it's called, right, congestive. It's, it's, it's actually fluid in the tissues. Um, Okay, I just want to say that we actually have done some other analyses to show that this is all actually related. The signaling, the changes that are TNF-alpha dependent are actually related to strain-dependent signaling pathways in our, in our cardiomyocytes. Uh, and it's different between the atria and the ventricles. And I just want to come, this is all the stuff we're doing. We can come back in the question period. Uh, and I just want to say uh, thanks to these people. Uh, Jeremy Simpson actually being up there. That's why I had to put this up here. Uh, where is he? Jeremy's right there, right? But uh, the other people that actually helped with this were uh, Naz Polodovic and Sabah Young, who are doing all the, the, some of the newer stuff that we're actually doing, which I, I'm not going to talk about. Okay, thanks for your attention. I'm sorry. Lots of words, but yeah. Actually, so I should have said that. They're just eating ad lit. Uh, so they, we didn't control their food intake. We gave them regular chow. Um, so it's a good question, right? We, sh we sh you know, I would anticipate, given the amount of work they were actually doing, right, that they would have been eating considerably more. Um, yeah, but we never monitored that. They just ate as much as they chose to. Now, the important point is that the sedentary, these are CD1 mice. After six weeks, uh, I didn't emphasize this, but the swimming mice are lean and mean, right, as you might anticipate. The sedentaries are kind of like couch potatoes, right? They are, they're flabby, they're actually a little, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a little bit, I won't call them obese, but they're certainly overweight. And the CD1s, if you take them out long enough, people have suggested that they're actually a, a model for diabetes, in fact, and metabolic disorders. Right, because they have a tendency to become, and that actually created problems for us in terms of our results, because if you take those animals out another six weeks, they end up getting fibrosis in their atria, but they're also obese at that point, right? So that's, again, the connection between obesity and atrial changes. So it made it difficult to do the proper control experiments to try to look at reversibility, right, which is, which is what we ended up doing, right? Uh, but the bottom line is that, that we really didn't have a proper control group. Yeah. Uh, do the front here? No, the back. Yeah. Nice presentation. So you showed some data from the custom skiers that had greater heart fibrillation. Yeah, increased incidence. And these are young people, right? They're still competing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, it's almost invariably, if you look at what athletes get this atrial condition and have the increased in incidence, and I didn't mention that, but the, the, the example uh, data that I showed you is all from athletes that are engaged in endurance sport. So what are those? Uh, the highest ones up there are rowers. Uh, cyclists, all the high cardiac output sports, right? Includes hockey players, actually. Uh, like virtually every hockey team, by the time guys are at 30, 35 years of age, there's one or two guys on every team that actually have AF or are dealing with it. Like Jason Spetsik, when he went to Dallas, right? He, he, had, he had AF, right? He had been ablated at least twice. 
But there's many examples of that of players in the NHL. So hockey is another one. But all the really, really high like uh, cardiac output endurance sports are the ones that are by far the most susceptible to. Well, I, you know, I mean, this is this is seen not just in. I mean, I, the, most of the. Uh, uh, many of the studies have been done in the really, really high-end athletes, but you can see even in recreational sport athletes, you see exactly the same thing. And when I first got my AF, I tell you, like I'm looking around for information to try to figure out what's going on, and I hit onto a, a Nordic website in Michigan, okay? And these are just recreational cross-country skiers. The entire dialogue on their website at that time was, I have AF, uh, how, what do I do about it? Uh, oh, you should go to Ann Arbor. Here's this guy. And the entire dialogue there was about AF, right? Now, those, again, are older people, right? But if you start to trim down, like Mansur Hussein once told me, he's a cardiologist, well-known cardiologist at, at Toronto General. He was taking care of the rowing team, the female rowing team from about three Olympics ago. And he told me, right, and I don't know if I'm quoting him, uh, quoting him correctly, he says that entire team of females, right, has, has AF right now. They're all dealing with AF. I'm not sure if they have AF, but, you know, it's those real, like the rowers, right, we know their, their cardiac output is off the charts, right? The cyclists, it's off the charts. Like Lance Armstrong had, what, a a peak output of 32 liters per minute or something like that. Of course, he was doping, right? And I would suspect that if you dope and you drive hard, you're just gonna drive this stuff, right? You're just gonna make it that much worse. The likelihood of you getting it is, just goes up. Yeah. Okay, I think we're gonna cut it up there. No, I, I wanna hear Glenn's question, if you don't mind. I'm gonna override you. Yeah, so when we published our first paper on this, actually, uh, we ran into the uh, RYR2 mafia, and they forced us to go back and look at the randine receptors and look at calcium, blah, 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 right? So no, I don't mean to insult you. But the, bo <laughs> the, bottom line, no, the bottom line is that it made no difference to us whether calcium was being altered because it's really collagen and inflammation, as far as we're concerned, are the important things. Now, having said that, there's no question that these cells are hypertrophied. There are definitely changes going on. Like we did cellular electrophysiology and there are changes and there are changes that in principle can help explain what we actually see. But we think those are kind of like along for the ride, maybe partly contributing. I think the action is all about figuring out um, fibrosis and inflammation, yeah. All right, so thank you. Okay, sorry, thanks. <laughs>